recently there's been a lot of global events things like the pandemic the black black lives matter movement sorry and all these things have accelerated the conversation around the need for social change especially with issues of anti-racism and decoloniality in music education studies to be specific what impact if any have these societal shifts had on your teaching or performance of global music um it's a good question uh because this has affected a lot of students and I, I basically everybody, you know, institutions are trying to make policies and students are trying to adjust and uh, professors are trying to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to manage situations. Uh, and it created a lot of tension in the system that you don't know how you will approach your studies or you don't know how you even talk to somebody before you get labeled, <laughs> you yeah. know, as a racist or this and that. So it's, it's quite a critical time, but I would say that, um, I, I would talk about me and school. Uh, I think this, the pandemic and all this craziness with uh, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism to some extent, it's a combination that has made people, uh, reasonable people have come to realize that, you know, they, they have come to understand each other better, especially when it comes to the pandemic. Yeah. You know, people who are distance away from each other, they can now see their friends in the eyes and say, you know, we are in this together. So there's a positive component uh, to that, that, you know, there's a solidarity, everybody, it's saying that this is the what is going on is not good. Let's fight the system. Uh, people get to know each other. At the same time, the pandemic, uh, the other way around is like, you know, everybody is so secluded, separated in a way. But with regards to uh, my teaching or my institution, I have always been. Uh, an advocate for diversity and because I came to this system feeling like I have not I don't have a place and I'm sure you know how you were feeling there uh, being far from home and you don't have anybody to talk to when situations arise yeah uh, and you don't want to bother people so after my master's and PhD, I decided to use, you know, any negative rhetoric or anything that I have experienced, channel it to be more there for students. Uh, I don't want them to go through any of the things that I've gone through. So when I came to Binghamton, I have advocated in addition to the universities, diversity, equity, and so we, we have a, we form our own departmental DIA, we call it diversity in action. Because sometimes when you go to report uh, cases to the bigger university office, they say they sympathize with you and they say, we'll, we'll get back to you and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And it was getting to that point where also in our department, uh, especially, uh, this doesn't relate to ensemble necessarily, but other classes yeah. uh, where professors don't want to stage uh, Black play writers. Mm. Uh, they don't want to perform works of Black composers or composers of color. Uh, so students feel alienated that, you know, this is not a department for them because, you know, they don't even want them to play some role. For instance, we would do Shakespeare in Ghana and nobody cares about who is the main character, but here they don't want a, a black person to be the main character. It, so you can, even if the person has talent. Yeah. So we form this DIA to, to challenge the system and push the, the professors to a corner. Uh, luckily for us, this black life movement reinforced that uh, we formed the committee to 2017 and uh, we did outreach and then you know, when I moved to a different department, it kind of died down. So we pick it up again last year and we are making a lot of policy changes. But I would say that uh, the, 
we have worked on on uh, decolonizing the curriculums a lot. Okay. Um, uh, it's not from Eurocentric perspective anymore. Uh, we are. Uh, I have shown videos to different faculty members um, about how to choose text and even scholarly works that reflect different people's background. For example, if you're talking about um, some musical tradition, you know, you, you, should, you can read it from Africa, you can pick another section from Asia, you can pick another section from Latin America, so that students have different perspective of how different cultures function. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, in my ensemble, we don't, we, it's hard to get that because that is what I promote. So I make sure that my students uh, live with, to that expectation. And, um, and I'm the only person so far, when you come to my class, you see African uh, from different places, you see Americans, you see uh, Germans, uh, Asians. So, and I've won two, three, four, I think three awards just for that being, you know, a, a class that is uh, very much diverse. And uh, so in my, in the ensemble class, diversity is there. Uh, definitely they come to understand the, the role of pandemic and appreciate humanity better. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. other classes are still working on that. University has put up policies to reinforce that so we are helping the university to to get to each goal but you know there's so much you can do uh those things um are still there yeah i'm happy to hear all of this and one interesting thing you said that stood out to me was when you were talking about the diversity in your class you mentioned that you also had africans in your class and that's really interesting to me especially when you come here most of the students in an african ensemble class are all white because a lot of Africans move here and it's like, I'm not moving here to do Ghanaian drumming and dance. I'm moving here to do hip hop. I'm moving here to do jazz. I'm moving here to do that. So was it a challenge getting Africans to join your class or it just happened? No. And, uh, you know, students talk a lot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, students can say they talk a lot. And, uh, yeah, I, I never knew students talk among themselves even in Ghana I know students but friends talk but here students if you're a bad professor or if you're a good professor student will sell you yeah right away yeah. A and that we say they're for diversity but they never really counted mm. for diversity mm. uh, so I think that that's a first the first step in the right direction for those uh, for that program um, we're working on some similar changes with the other curriculums too, the other music curriculums too but uh, as a result of that music right now we only have music education that's uh, been changed in that way um, you know for myself I think it's it really important um, it just to stress the colonial histories of a lot of these ensembles uh, as I'm teaching and uh, that the students know you know what what we're doing mm -hmm. um, especially you know in the, in the case of uh, our African music and dance class if we if I've learned you know, a piece and it's, we've learned of several different versions. Well, it's important to know who taught me each one of those versions and how they've choreographed. That way there's a difference between what the movement is for a piece and who's choreographed a piece mm -hmm. of music. Or is it done in a, you know, is it done in a sort of a ballet style or a something from a national theater standpoint? Or mm -hmm. is it done more in a village context in this way? Um, that way they can see the results of the, you know, the, the colonial impact, even just on performance. Uh, that way it's, that way they know that what we're staging isn't necessarily how it might be done in one context versus another. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's, I think that that's a really important part uh, with that. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, with this research, working on it, it's just made me realize that decolonization doesn't just need to happen here in America it is actually affected us too. And when I hear about people's experiences here, I realized our educational system has also been colonized because it's the same thing here, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're also taught, we've, we've been, been taught that traditional music is a bit occultic, it's other music. So even back in Ghana, 
piano, guitar, all these Western instruments are prioritized over Ghanaian drumming and dancing. And so it's quite interesting. We all have work to do. And I just, it's just really interesting seeing people realize this and are actually willing to. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, I think that's a really important point. And um, I also think, you know, in, in terms of, you know, some of the social uh, issues here, I think it's, I think it's important that, you know, my students know that um, social issues for, say, a Ghanaian aren't the same as a Black American, yeah. right? Because there, there's, because there's, there's diversity there too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's really important to stress. And that's, you know, in all these contexts. With. Um, as music education practitioners, it's all well and good to say we need to embrace the world's musics. But if we don't meet it where it is, um, then we're just perpetuating sort of the status quo of our own way of habitua habituating musical relationships. Mm. And so just because we sing a song from fill in the blank with a country other than the United States. It doesn't mean that we're inclusive. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're um, in search of equity. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're in search of understanding somebody other than ourselves. Hmm. Um, and so part of the impulse for beginning this ensemble at the, at the start was to do just that, was to meet another's music from whence it came, rather than to just pretend like we're doing that, um, because that's all it would be, would be a nod and a pretentious kind of um, cliche. Um, and so I thought it was really important that we had authentic tradition bearers teach this music to our students, impart the ways of the teaching and learning of this music to our students, so that when they become teachers, that they can teach their students the authentic ways of being with this music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, Black Lives Matter and the pandemic and the social inequities that have just you know, come to the surface because of necessity, given the climate and the times and the political upheaval um, around the world, um, it just made that much more um, imperative um, to do this work and to do it louder and to do it more and, um, and to make sure that we're as mindful and as sensitive as possible um, to other ways of experiencing the world. And that's including musical ways of experiencing the world. I would say that, you know, the the social change aspect of society coming more to the front is is way overdue and way behind and i've been teaching all of that connectivity and listening and inclusivity uh, including everything that's alive not just people of different races and sexualities and genders but nature all of nature mm -hmm. uh, teaching that since 19 81 so uh, West African music already has all that stuff in it um, yes uh, the traditional West African culture is very hierarchical but one thing about Ghanaian music especially is it doesn't and you, it's very hard to generalize about all of Ghanaian music since there are more than 50 different tribes and ethnic groups and they all have their variations but very common is that um, they don't like somebody one person to stand out too much even the leader if somebody mm -hmm. is showing off too much everyone else will kind of pull that person down um, it's much more community oriented keeping everyone involved yes there needs to be a timekeeper yes there needs to be a lead drummer but that person is integral not dominating mm -hmm. and um, so that's been always been part of the philosophy of west african music and i've always been teaching that what has become more important about teaching West African music these days has been the effects of the pandemic uh, and also the societal effects uh, that our country has been going through. I don't know if it's as bad in Canada, but here our country has become highly polarized and there's so much hate and divisiveness, which was aggravated by the pandemic because then people became more isolated. They weren't 
mixing socially. Everyone was afraid of catching the disease from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Schools were closed. Learning was done online. And so people became more disconnected from each other. West African music is the one of the most connective activities that people can do. Uh, music is, but West African music really focuses on connecting with a big group of people. So that aspect of the music has become even more important and more valuable than it was before. There are more people that are willing to acknowledge that music has a role, that music is not only sound, that music doesn't exist without people, but I am finding pushback against then somebody wanting to follow through with change. Yes, that's tragic. Yes, there are things that can be done, but not in orchestra. Yes, that's, that's an emergency. Yes, that's important. We all need to contribute, but that doesn't have anything to do with my band, right? Or, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change. And this is how we do things. And um, we're having these very conversations in my department. So for me, all what it's really done is made me buckle down harder okay. and to be less. I mean, we've only been talking a few minutes, but you can see how I am. I just, I, I, there's no time, right? Mm -hmm. There's no time to waste. So I am perhaps even less patient, not that I was, but less patient with colleagues that are blocking this work mm -hmm. or feeling that it's, my department, for example, we're almost 100% white faculty. And I feel as though many of my colleagues would like it to be up to the one black colleague that we have or the one Latina colleague that we have instead of we're all responsible for it. So I've just decided my role is to be the squeaky wheel all the time, all the time. Um, and just even my thinking about global music ensembles, um, even before the pandemic and, and Black Lives Matter um, and the death of George Floyd, uh, I, I was already having these questions because I worked so much in the community and I had a community group and I was asking myself these questions around representation and, and you know, as you know, um, I, I have a long standing connection to the Ghanaian community and the support of the Ghanaian community uh, in terms of the work that I do. But and and also we we bring in Ghanaian guest artists to work. But um, I had. <sighs> I just I I just was wondering about what is the role of this kind of an ensemble when in terms of education like how are we best um able to um sort of leave open um space for culture bearers to be teaching this um because even the way that we teach this is very western so yes we're teaching a non-western style but it is a very western presentational style and we do a concert at the end of the term Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes time for things at, um, for the group at Carleton, I was already thinking about things like costume, you know, which is very common in Ghana for people to be dressed head to toe in, in beautiful patterned cloth. Mm -hmm. But is that okay for students at a university who are learning this to be doing this? And so I had some of these questions already. And I think that, you know, the social changes that have been happening, um, in the last couple of years have really just accelerated um my thinking around this which is why i really wanted to start this research project reimagining the global music ensemble um and there's so many layers to it you know we 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 need to think about repertoire we need to think about who is in the group we need to think about how can we reach out further into the university um to involve more students um to be understanding this because we have a very sort of small population of our music students and it would be really nice to just kind of open that up and I think also, you know, this kind of um, colonial package of traditional drum and dance that that many universities, you know, participate in and put on stage at the end of the term um, is is just that it's a colonial package that has um, served many people well, including many Ghanaian guest artists who travel around and, and perform with these ensembles. But mm -hmm. 
there are so many other ways things can be happening and there's so many other kinds of arts in the di diaspora and so I was really hoping with this research project that we could find ways to um, to expand the repertoire, to expand the voices heard in leadership, to um, bring in people like yourself and other guest artists. We, we really didn't have a budget for guest artists um, at Carleton to, for this ensemble. So even though we did some collaborations, we usually had to have community partnerships to do that. So I really wanted to find ways to kind of rethink how we're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a very open-ended question. Like it, it's it's affected me hugely, and I, I don't have answers yet. But I'm I'm just kind of wanting to be talking to people, which is what this project is all about. So mm -hmm. uh, to see how we move forward. And you raised very very important stuff, and what stood out to me was the issue of the costume. And I I don't know personally, I feel if you are teaching, like culture is the entire way of a group of people, the entire way of life. So if we're learning the culture, I feel we can't take some out. Because it would be strange if we're dancing Gahu and we're, we're in jeans and a t-shirt or a crop top. It doesn't feel safe. Like someone exactly. may see it and appreciate it, but then it's like, you could have, you know, dressed better. Yeah. So yes. if anyone feel makes you feel like, you are not supposed to wear it because you're not from there. I feel if you are doing the dance, you have to wear what you wear. Well, and that is the big question. And, you know, if you're a jazz artist, do you dress like a jazz artist? Like, what does a jazz artist look like? And, yeah. and participate in some of the, you know, enculturation of, of the jazz community um, in order to be a better jazz musician. I mean, there's these, these are big questions, but when we're talking about, um, you know, sort of a cultural group in an educational setting, um, I think, you know, we really do have to be thinking about this. And I'm not sure what the right answer is. I mean, my Ghanaian teachers would want us to be wearing those traditional outfits. Mm -hmm. um, and I've kind of always done a hybrid where we do a t-shirt with the group's logo on it. And then we do, you know, some kind of cloth on the bottom. And mm -hmm. as you know, we experimented with a slightly different look, more modern look of the cloth um, in our last show. But you know, I'm I'm just not sure, and it and to me, we really have to have this conversation about what is the role of these ensembles, um, you know, uh, in in a sort of post secondary um, music, you know, program like we have. Yeah, and to what you're saying, I feel that's why it's essential to have the cultural culture bearers, like you said, because if maybe you would be teaching an Indian dance or Indian culture and you have no one there like representing that and then you just got the costumes from Amazon. So we don't even know if it's the authentic one, you know, yeah. we don't know if it's coming from the right place, if it's the right cloth, if it's for the right thing. And then maybe that's, someone you see it from the outside and be offended, but then you always bring a guest artist who has expertise, who is from that culture. And if you have that, I don't think you have an issue because then they are giving you that go ahead. This is my culture and I would like this to happen. I would like it to be this way. And they will, will even give you the costumes you need. Like you getting it from Kwasi Junior, you got it from Dana, you got it from the source. You didn't buy it um, at the Toronto market or something. Right. And, you know, so it's, you are not disrespecting the culture in any way. Well, and I think that comes into play with the artistic direction, right? So it's not just about guest artists, but who is artistically directing yeah. the ensemble and yeah. what are the choices that you make for that? Um, so, you know, why is the choir wearing, you know, black dress clothes or tuxedos mm -hmm. when they perform? And, and you know, I mean, there's, there's sort of costumes for all of these um, kinds of ensembles that we have. So, um, but I think when you're an artistic director, those are choices you make and you, you won't please everyone. And there is no one way exactly. to do it anyway. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a fine line for sure. Um, it's a messy bit. I always talk about the messy bits in intercultural, um, learning and, uh, teaching. Um, but that I think is where we make progress is in those kind of messy bits and having those conversations. Mm -hmm.